Hello everyone! Hope all of you are doing well. Thank you so much for watching. This is a video regarding clarification on Monsuk certification documents. We hope you enjoyed this and thank you again for joining us on this presentation. So this presentation will cover the objectives, why we are recording this, what is the, the motivation for this, also, we included an overview of the Zucru certification documents to review uh, what documents we have and the role of each one. And then we're going, we're going to go through indicator by indicator or requirement by requirement, requirement that we identified that need a clarification. So these indicators slash requirements cover three main uh, documents. The first one is Bansukru Production Standard, the new version, the 5.1. It covers as well Bansukru Mass Balance for Chain of Custody Standard, the version 5.1, and the Bansukru Certification Protocol, the new one, the version 6. Why are we sharing this video with you? What motivated us to create this clarification uh, training material. So during the rollout of the new Monsuku production standard and the new certification protocol, we received a lot of queries from different stakeholders. And also we applied exams paper as part of auditors and training providers qualification. And some of the questions we made and some of the queries we received made us realize that uh, we needed to provide further clarification because some of the indicators uh, maybe are not clear enough and people are not understanding the aim of those indicators. So this was the reason why we are creating and sharing with you this presentation. Before going through the clarifications on specific indicators, we would like to review with you the Bunsuku certification documents to give you an overview of all relevant documents. So you can see that we divided all these documents in different colors, colors category. So all of them that are category green means that they are mandatory documents. Those that are classified as gray means that they are tools that support the green documents, the green category documents, the mandatory ones. And those class, uh, cl uh, classified as orange, these ones, are documents that are not mandatory. They are auxiliary documents that will support the other documents. Uh, we can see uh, that you have as mandatory as green category, the first one, the certification protocol. In summary, the certification protocol is the document that sets all rules for all certification, for all scopes, for all those documents. So this document is above the others because applies in a certain way to all of them, okay? Uh, after that, we have the production standard that will apply for meals and farms that these are the mandatory documents. To support this, we have the Bansuku calculator that you might have heard about this, and also the implementation guidance. The implementation guidance supports these documents, but it, they are not mandatory. It means that a certification body cannot issue a non-conformant against uh, a requirement that is on the implementation guidance because they are not mandatory. They are there only to support, to give examples, to give more idea on how to implement the requirements, but they are not mandatory, okay? So we have also the smallholder farm, farmer's standard that has its own calculator and also the farm diaries that are tools that support the standard. We have also the mass balance for chain of custody standard that has one implementation guidance that will support the implementation of those indicators. But the difference here is that the implementation guidance is issued in the same document as the standard. So they are together. But again, a non-conformity can be issued only against the indicators on the standard, not against any indicator any recommendation on the guidance, okay? 
Also, we have the ERAD standard that now is separately from the production standard that uh, states uh, requirements for biofuels uh, that will be commercialized, trade into the European Union. So it's one option for members to be uh, seeking for certification. It's not uh, an obligation to include this on the scope, but it seems the operator decided to work with this on the scope, this becomes mandatory. It means they have to comply with all indicators on this standard. And also we have a new document. Uh, we didn't have this before. It's new, it has been published in January 2022 as well. Uh, that is certification audit guidance. So this is a non-mandatory document, but is a guidance to auditors, to certification body on how to check the, the indicators that uh, are published in production standard and the other indicators. So far, we are in August 2022, we have only indication for production standard on this guidance, but the idea is include uh, guidance for all scopes, for all documents, okay? So this is an overview of the documents, and we'd like to share as well that you we have other two important documents in our website. One is the FAQ, that means uh, we put together the most asked questions we received to clarify something that's not clear on the standard or on the guidance. And also we have this errata log that is published in our website as well, that identifies, that lists all uh, mistakes, typo or wording mistakes that are published in, in all of those documents. And we list this here before we include this in a new version. It is because we cannot issue a new version of each document every week, for example. So we are concentrating all errors, mistakes, and items that need to be corrected in the, pre in the next versions of the documents. And then we're gonna address this in the next uh, publications. After reviewing all documents that the Bonsuk certif certification system covers, we are ready to start with clarifications. So, as I mentioned before, we're going to go through three main documents, and the first one will be the Bonsuk Production Standard version 5.1. The indicators that this presentation will cover are those on this list. Now we will review some indicators that are under the principal one. As I mentioned before, the sucre production standard has five principles. And now we will review a few indicators that are under this principal one. We won't cover all indicators from this standard, only those that need some further clarification. Regarding indicator 1.2.3 and 1.2.4, Understanding the definition of area outside unit of certification is very important. It is because these indicators apply to this area. So it's a new concept on the Bonsuk production standard, and it's very important to have this clarified. So before going through the definition, let's review these two indicators. The tier indicator of this criterion uh, is the operator conducts and documents an improvement opportunity assessment outside the unit of certification. This is a core indicator. I know the scope is the area outside the unit of certification. This is one of the two indicators where, where the Bonsuka production standard asks for the, for the operators to see some risk outside the unit of certification. So conduct and document an assessment that identifies opportunities to address adverse social and environmental conditions as framed by core indicators from two to four. So only these indicators on risk on principle two, three, and four of the Bonsurco production standard. That, that assessment, of course, uh, shall be revised at least every three years uh, to be sure that this is updated. 
1.2.4 is the second indicator with the scope of the area outside of the unit of certification. The operator develops and implements a continuous improvement plan to address the salient opportunities identified outside the unit of certification. So it's linked with the previous indicator. And the idea is based on, on this indicator to, to, to construct at this continuous improvement plan. It shall be progressive and appropriate to the size, sector, operational context, ownership, and structure of the operator, with achievable action at the objective, agreed responsibilities, time frames, and allocated resources. This plan is to be updated at least every two years. And very important, if conversion of natural ecosystem has been identified as a risk on the risk assessments on 1.2.3, then it should be addressed as a matter of priority on this indicator. To understand what area outside the unit of certification means, let's have a look on this example. So here we have the sugar mill, and here we have the farms that supply cane, the farms that supply cane to the mill. All these farms together are the supply base of the mill. So these farms can be own, uh, farms owned by the mill, can be leased farms or even external suppliers. So the Munster production standard do not require a minimum or maximum number of farms to be included in the scope of certification. It's totally up to the operator. So in our example, we are supposing we are including only two farms to this scope. So the area outside the unit of certification will be the difference of the supply base farms minus those that was included in the unit of certification. So this, that these two farms that was included on in the scope are do, those farms that shall comply, shall implement and comply with indicators under Bonsuco production standard. In the previous version of the standard, the other farms, those that are not included in the scope, didn't have to comply with any indicator on the standard. But in now, this new approach, these new two indicators, indicator 1.2.3 and 1.2.4, aims to promote the standard outside the scope. So it's a possibility uh, to have an oversight by the mill on the other farms that wasn't included in the scope. So through a risk assessment, this mill can identify issues on the farms that are not on the scope and through a continuous improvement plan address those issues. Giving you more resources on this topic, uh, we'd like to share that this has been included in the Bonsucre Standard and Assurance FNQ. So, here there is the link, you can access this uh, document and see all questions we publish there. So as I mentioned, there is one question about uh, does the new Bonsuk production standard require 100% of supply area to be included in the unit of certification? And the answer is no, as I mentioned before. So it's it hasn't changed comparing the previous version of the standard and the current one, the new one, 5.1. And also we included on the FAAQ, what does area outside unit of certification mean? So this refers to areas supplying the meal, but not included in the scope of certification. It may include areas which are owned or leased by the meal, external suppliers, production areas, smallholder farms, etc. Hope this is clear now. Indicator 1.3.1. So we included this indicator here because we would like to clarify the new approach of this indicator, comparing to the similar version of this indicator uh, in the previous version of this standard. So this indicator, the operator has a documented management system in place to identify track and promote compliance with all applicable local, national, and ratified international laws and regulations. So this indicator is more focused in promote compliance. An operator has a system in place to promote compliance. The previous version of this indicator uh, asked to operator comply with legislation. So now it has been changed because we would like uh, 
not to penalize the operator in case they are doing everything that are under their control to promote compliance. So this indicator aims ensuring that the operator understand the legal framework in which they are operating and act to be in compli compliance with uh, applicable legislation. So it's, it's not only a matter of comply or not comply. So we would like that the operator identify the uh, legislation that apply to them, uh, that they track if they are complying or not, they, that they put actions in place to promote uh, this compliance, to be in compliance with the legislations that apply to them. Uh, let's give one example to make it clear. Let's suppose that during one audit, uh, one auditor identified that one sugar mill uh, had its, uh, one of their license uh, expired. So the auditor did one investigation and identified that the operator has uh, complied with all requirements by law to renew these lines. So provided all documents uh, within the time frame established by legislation, um, identified these, had action in place to uh, renew this, this license. So in other words, the operator has done everything that was under his power, under his control. The reason that the, this license hasn't been issued was because uh, the, the authority responsible for that uh, had some internal delays for any reason. So in this case, the orientation is not to issue a non-conformity against indicator 1.3.1 because being the operator has uh, uh, put in place everything that was under his control to uh, renew this license. So this is the new approach. We are we are not we will not issue a non-conformity against this indicator only because they are not in, uh, complying with. So in this specific case, we won't issue a non-conformity against this one three one indicator. However, it can be, it might be a non-conformity against other indicators on this standard, depend on the situation, depend on the case. Okay, so this is the new approach of the indicator. Operator has to have a system in place to, com to promote a compliance. It means uh, put in place everything that are under their control to uh, promote compliance, to be in compliance with legislation. So in the next slide, we're gonna review this indicator again. The first indicator of this criteria, 1.3.1, the operator has a system in place to promote compliance with the all applicable local, national, and ratified international laws and regulation. This is a core indicator for meal and agriculture in the unit of certification and two, it's important that the operator has a documented management system in place to identify, track, and promote compliance with all applicable law, national, and ratified international laws and regulations. We will see after how this system works. So very important that point, if the bon sucre standard and national law conflict, the operator shall seek ways to honor the principle of the bon sucre production standard wherever possible where the domestic context renders it impossible to meet this responsibility fully. Operators shall respect the principle of the bon sucre production standard to the greatest extent possible in the circumstances and shall demonstrate their efforts in this regard without contravening law, regulation, or even court decisions. So important in this point of view, uh, bon sucre production standard uh, it need a system to promote compliance with the law. If there is not possible, uh, the, the or circumstances don't allow that. So the operator need to be clear that have the greatest extent possible in the circumstances they have. Indicator 1.4.2. The operator ensures that there is a mechanism to raise the grievances. The reason why we included this indicator here is because we've received a lot of questions asking what should and what should not be included in the grievance mechanism. So everything that is required by the indicator is written in this full indicator wording. Uh, 
meaning if it's written here, it is required, and if it's not written here, it's not a requirement, okay? So everything you need to know regarding one indicator is written in the full indicator wording. But in summary, the grievance mechanism, uh, the operator shall establish and put in place a grievance mechanism, and this mechanism shall be accessible to all affected parties. So this is important to mention here. Also, this grievance mechanism uh, shall be able to receive a dispute, complaining, and resolve those disputes. And also, uh, ensuring that anonymity uh, happens when requested, not to put in risk those that are requ uh, requesting, are complaining, not to cause an intimidation. And another important thing related to grievance mechanism is that uh, the operator has to put a procedure in place for uh, this mechanism, for this grievance mechanism, and this procedure shall be understood by the affected parties. So it's not a matter to implement a grievance mechanism, but it shall be understood by the affected parties. It means that they have to understand uh, how is the procedure to raise a grievance, what is uh, the time frame to receive an uh, answer, uh, what they should be do, what, what is involved in this mechanism. So this is very important, be accessible to affected parties and as well as be, uh, be the system in place, be understood by the affected parties. Now we will move on to principle two to review a few indicators that are under this principle. Indicator 2.2.2, the operator ensures that working hours at farm and mill complies with national legislation. So this indicator is a core indicator and applied to the mill and the agriculture area included in this scope. So this indicator established the limit of hours, of working hours allowed by week. It shall comply with national legislation. It means it will vary depending on the location the farms or mill are. Uh, so there is no limit. It shall comply with local legislation, with national legislation. However, in any case, if the workers work more than six hours per week, the operator shall conduct and document a risk assessment to ensure that excessive hours, working hours, does not compromise health and safety. So even if the legislation allows work more than 60 hours per week, the operator shall conduct this risk assessment to guarantee, to identify if this exceed of hours do not cause any problem, any compromise on the health and safety of the workers. Also, it's important to say that uh, the workers shall also have at least one day off per week or two days off every 14 days worked. So if the employee works one whole week, seven days, uh, this work has to have one day off or two in two weeks, in 14 days. Indicator 2.3.6, the operator records working hours lost due to absenteeism. Uh, regarding this indicator, we received a lot of questions asking what absenteeism means, which kind of hours should be considered as absenteeism. So, in this indicator, it's important to mention that all non-justified uh, absence is considered at absenteeism. So if there is one worker that it was, uh, he, he, she was supposed to go to work and didn't show up with no justification, it is considered as absenteeism. However, if this worker didn't show up because he, she was on holiday or on maternity leave or paternity leave or attending a training or because of any other legal time off, it's not considered as absenteeism. It's gonna be considered as absenteeism, all non-justified absence, including strikes. So if uh, the operator was expecting 
the worker to go and work in that day and didn't show up with no justification, it's, it is absenteeism. Let's move on to principle three of this standard and review a few indicators under this principle. Indicator 3.1.1, the operator ensures that yields of production are above the threshold set by the climate zone map. So this indicator will apply to the agriculture and the standard required will be will vary depending on the location of the production of the sugar cane. So it's going to require a minimum tons of cane per hectare, depend where this farm is located. So the most common error here is that uh, people don't know where to find this tool, the climate zone map uh, developed by Bonsucro. So here is the link that gives access to this tool. And in the next slide, we're gonna review a video explaining how to use this tool. So in this video, we will see how the, the link for identify uh, the yield on the, on the platform will works. So we put the climate zone map in Bonsucro. Yes, you can see here. And now we can find that here we have the different climatic zones. We can approach maybe to Colombia, South America. We can see the different climatic zones. And we'll find a place, let's say a farm close to Puerto Tejada. So we go here, we go search, okay. Puerto Tejada, Cauca. Colombia is here. Let's go. Now we have here the place, and we can find in the in the map, for example, a farm. Let's say that one. Okay, and uh, I have that the 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 farms are on this on this climatic zones. This is the more representative, of course, actually, and I can find that this is eleven, the climatic zone eleven here. So that's it. So easy. Now we need to include that on the calculator, on the Bonsucro calculator, to be sure that that information will be linked to my yields. I will repair my yields. Okay. Thank you so much. Indicator 3.1.4, the operator shall conduct the harvesting operations efficiently. So the reason we put this indicator here is to clarify the standard required by this indicator. So you're going to have three different standards that will vary depending on the type of harvesting this cane uh, has. So for cane that was harvested mechanically and green, uh, it means with no burning, the standard required is less than 16 hours. So uh, we have to start counting this time as soon as the harvesting is starting until this cane get delivered in the sugar mill to be crushed. So it means on the weight bridge, on the entrance of the mill where this information is recorded. So for green cane, harvest mechanically, the time from starting harvesting until get delivered to the mill is less, shall be less than 16 hours. For cane that is green harvested, but in manual, the, the standard changes a bit and shall be less than 24 hours. And for cane that was burnt, was harvesting burnt, it doesn't matter if it was manually or mechanically, the hours, the standard change a bit and, and sh uh, shall be less than 48 hours. But here, pay attention, the burn cane is measures the time from when burning of the field prior to the harvest. So for burn cane, burnt cane, we started counting the time when the burning is starting, not when the harvesting is started, okay? And this this amount should be this this average time should be less than 48 hours. 
indicator 3.1.5, the operator crush scan efficiently. So this indicator requires at least 75% of time efficient, efficiency. It means 75% of the total crushing time the mill was running, was crushing uh, cane efficiently. So it has to consider all time the mill was running, excluding all type of stoppage, with exception only for rainfall, that's here in the indicator, with exception of stops due to rainfall exclusively. So we included this indicator here to clarify how to use the, cal uh, the calculator regarding this indicator. So here we put a screenshot of the calculator. So in this part here, you can see the two entry data on input data tab that will be considered in this uh, indicator. And here above, we have the screenshot of P3 mill tab, the tab where the result will be disclosed. For those that are not very used, familiar with the calculator, any information, any data entry should be included in the input data. So sometimes we hear that the calculator is not working because it is locked, because it's asking for a password to use. So all tabs on the calculator will be locked unless the input data tab that operators can enter their numbers, their data in the yellow cells and auditors can amend this during the audits. And this is the only tab with exceptions of other entry data points, for example, for ERAD, that operators and auditor can uh, enter data. The other tabs, such as P3 mu tab, are locked. So you can see only the final result, the, 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 the result of the indicators in these tabs. So going back to indicator 3.1.5, how can we use the calculator to check conformance against this indicator? First of all, we have two uh, rows that we, we need to enter data to make able the calculator calculate the final result. So the first one is row 236 that says time spent processing came. And the second row is 237 that send, says length of crushing season. So what's the difference between these two uh, data entry point? The first one, time spent processing cane, the operator has to count uh, the time in hours, expressed in hours, as you can see here, that the mill was running. Exactly the mill that crushes the cane was running, was working, discounting all types of stoppage. If the, uh, the mill stopped because it has a maintenance planned or a maintenance not planned or any kind of stoppage, you have to discount of these hours. So you have the total uh, hours available during the crushing season and discount those that the mill wasn't working. And we're going to put exactly the time spent processing cane, with the only exception, as we men mentioned before, for stoppage due to rainfall. So if the mill is stopped because it's raining and there is no way to bring the cane to crush, it means is there is no action that the mill can do. It's something you have to wait. It's not count as a stoppage. It's the only exception. So the other stoppage you have to discount from this number. So here in the row 236, so you have to enter the time spent processing cane, the total time the millings were working, were working. Okay. And in the next row, the row 237, length of crushing season, you have to put in days, the total days available since the crushing season started until this crushing season stopped, finished, the last day. So it's the length, the duration from the first day the cane started to be crushed in that period, in that season, until the last day, the, the last uh, time uh, the meal processed cane. So 
it's going to be should be entered in days and then in the p3 tab uh, p3 mil tab sorry the calculator has a formula here so it's not disclosed in here but if you open the calculator and click on the cells you can see the calculation this is going to calculate the percentage uh, of uh, cane, uh, crushes cane, so the efficiency, and we're going to show if it's in compliance or not. To be in compliance, uh, this result should be greater than 75%, as it is shown here in the calculator. Let's review now some indicators under Principle 4 of the Sucre Production Standard. Under principle four, uh, more exactly on the criterion 4.1, we received a lot of questions, uh, especially related to the conversion conversion dates for conversion from areas classified as protected, classified as natural ecosystem into agriculture. And what is the difference between the dates we have on the standard? What has been changed? So let's try to clarify this. We have two indicators under this criterion, the indicator 4.1.3 and 4.1.4. .4. So it's important to, to mention that it has been changed compared to the previous version of the standard. Because before we have uh, only one cutoff date, and we talked in the previous version of the standard about eight CV areas, areas, uh, high conservation value areas in protected areas. And now the, this new standard, the version 5.1, uh, brings the, the definition of natural ecosystem. So if you'd like to review this, what a natural ecosystem means, what a natural ecosystem includes, uh, we really encourage you to rewatch the training material on Bonsuku Production Standard version 5.1 that is published in our website. So uh, revisit this, rewatch the criterion 4.1 that will uh, help you to understand. But what we would like to, to make clear is that the, this standard, this new standard, has the, the approach of natural ecosystem. It's included natural ecosystem. So, and you have two indicators regarding this. The indicator 4.1.3, that the uh, conversion date is January 1st, January 2008, says that the operator ensures that no areas of natural ecosystem defined internationally or nationally as legally protected has been converted into agriculture on or after this date of 1st January 2008. And in the next indicator 414, we have that the operator ensures that no other areas of natural ecosystem have been converted to agriculture on or after 1st January 2021. So what's the difference, the main difference between these two indicators uh, apart from the date? So in the 413, we have that no area that is classified as natural ecosystem defined as legally protected uh, has not been converted. So this area classified as natural ecosystem should be national or internationally protected, legally protected, and cannot be converted first, uh, after, on or after this first January 2008. But in the next indicator in 414, the difference is that no area of natural ecosystem can be converted. Doesn't matter if these natural ecosystem areas are legally protected or not. So this is the main difference between these two indicators. One should be legally protected and the other one doesn't matter. Uh, after 1st January 2021, any area classified as natural ecosystem cannot be converted into agriculture. And here we have another difference because in the previous version of the standard, we were talking about area converted to sugarcane. And now we are talking about any conversion to agriculture. It's not possible to convert any of these natural ecosystem areas into agriculture. It doesn't matter if we're gonna crop sugarcane or soybeans or any other crop. So it's slightly different. Uh, 
So what is a natural ecosystem? How, or what is the definition? So we, as I mentioned, it is, uh, there is a definition on the standard and also we invited you to revisit the training, but you have extra documents that has been published together with the, the new standard, that is the HCV guidances. So we have four different guidances that will help operator implementing and understanding the criterion 4.1. The first guidance, uh, supply base mapping version one, we have this available in the three languages, English, in Spanish, and Portuguese, uh, will help operators to mapping the supply base as it is required by indicator 4.1.1. So here uh, in this guidance, operators will find how to mapping this supply base in, with regarding to biodiversity, as well as identify uh, areas of natural ecosystem. So we really recommend you, strongly recommend you to have a look to read this guidance. We have the other three guidances as well. The guidance for developing a biodiversity management plan that is gonna help operators to implement indicator 4.2.2. And then two different guidance, one uh, more focus on operators and one more focus on experts when the operator would like to expand the area in, with regarding indicator 4.1.5. So there is guidance here that helps operator identify if they can or not expand area. Okay, so we strongly recommend you to visit the, the, our website. So all these documents are published in our website through this link, you can have access and read all of them that will uh, help you to understand better uh, this criterion 4.1. And in the two next slides, I put again the explanation about these two different indicators, 413 and 414. Let's uh, watch this again. Now, in 4.1.3, uh, the indicator says that the operator ensures that no areas of natural ecosystem defined internationally or nationally as legally protected has been converted to agriculture on or after 1st of January 2008. So it's important to conduct a land use change analysis, a LUCA, of the unit of certification to determine and to be sure and cross, cross this information uh, uh, with actual information, maybe with the map in 4.1.1, to be sure that no sugar king have been, have been converted uh, or damaged natural ecosystem identified as international or national as legally protected. So the second indicator that I need to include in this land use analysis is 4.1.4. So the operator ensures that no other areas of natural ecosystem have been converted to agriculture on or after 1st of January 2021. We link that two indicators uh, in the same implementation and auditing of the guidance. So this is a core indicator and the operator conducts, a, of course, land use change analysis of the certification to determine what's the, uh, what the land use change between 1st of January 2021 and the actual date. So minimal levels of conversion are permissible, of course, if that's minimum, uh, it can be converted. And uh, of course, prior to any greenfield expansions or new agriculture projects, the operator conducts a bonsurco risk assessment for expansion that we will need to see in next indicators. So please note that a remediation and compensation procedure or equivalent document may be pushed in the future, in fact, in the future which will be applied to this indicator, uh, taking into account maybe uh, new, new, new members. Still under criteria 4.1, we have the indicator 416 that says that the operator conducts an Asia when there is a significant change in operation or land expansion. So first of all, Asia or ESIA, Environmental and Social Impact Assessment, should be carried out when operator has significant changes in operation or land expansion. 
when we ask it in which situation uh, environmental and social impact assessment should be carried out, sometimes we have different answers. <laughs> so for this reason, we would like to clarify. There is only under this standard, under this indicator 416, three situations that need, when happens, need to be covered by environmental and social impact assessment. They are major chains to the work for the workforce sorry though so uh, when we have major change to the workforce for example a mechanization when you have manual cutting and then which uh, the operation change for, me uh, for mechanically harvesting it's a major change to the workforce so uh, environmental and social impact assessments shall be carried out the second uh, case that Asia should be carried shall be carried out is when we have field expansion here field expansion it means if the expansion is greater than five percent of the total supply area or thousand hectares uh, environmental and social impact assessment shall be carried out and the last situation that uh, Asia sh shall be carried out is when uh, we have uh, the operator uh, establish new sugar operations that's in here establishment of new sugar operations so all these three chains three significant chains or land expansion shall be covered by environmental and social impact assessment so in the next slide we put again the training on this indicator to clarify a little bit more now the last indicator of this criterion 4.1.6 the operator conducts an environmental and social impact assessment when there is a significant change in operations or land expansions this is a core indicator and for all of course 100 percent of the new expansions or or new operations so of course when there are major changes of the workforce also for example mechanization or field expansion of more than 5% of total supply area, or 5% of rowing average, or a thousand hectares, whichever is smaller, or of course, establishment of new sugar operations like mills, etc. So, changes are covered by the environmental and social impact assessment. Regarding indicators 4.2.3 and 4.2.3, Point four. We would like to uh, clarify with you how you use the calculator to check this indicator. But before this, let's uh, review what this indicator talk talks about. So 4.2.3 says that the operator conducts regular soil or leaf analysis. In 4.2.4, uh, the operator applies as much fertilizer as recommended by soil analysis. So here I put the standard just to, to remind you what the standard requires here. Uh, so the result of this indicator should be uh, less than 1.05 for each nutrient. So the rate of, uh, applied. It means that uh, the calculator will divide the total amount of fertilizer applied by the total amount of fertilizer recommended. And this ratio shall be less than 1.05. In other words, less than uh, you, you, we cannot exceed 5% of the recommendation of fertilizer for each nutrient. nutrient. So let's see how the calculator uh, calculates this and what, what should the operator enter in the calculator to have uh, the result in compliant or not? So, with regarding to the calculator, here we have this screenshot for indicator 4.2.3 and 4.2.4 under P4 Agric tab. So, in these rows here, we have uh, the result, the calculation formulas and the result for 423 and in these rules we have the information formulas and results for indicator 424. I put the two together because some of the information used for 424 will be used for 423. Okay, uh, it's important to mention that my calculator is in blank so there is no data, no number there for this reason 
there is some errors presented and non-conformances, but it's because there is no data. Since uh, operator entered data in the input data, it's going to be automatically calculate, calculated. Okay, so for indicator four to three, operator conducts regular soil and leaf analysis. What will be considered to check conformance or not against this indicator will be the data entered about uh, fertilizer recommendation by soil analysis or leaf analysis uh, for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So the amount in kilos recommended. So we have to enter the amount recommended and the calculator will check if there is a recommended amount made by soil analysis, it's going to be disclosed here as compliance. And the auditor will check if uh, indeed the recommendations uh, has been made based on soil analysis. And in the next indicator four to four, uh, we have some different information that will be considered here. So the operator has to enter in the calculator the total amount of nitrogen, potassium and phosphor applied and recommended, uh, expressed in kilograms. And here, as I mentioned before, here is P4 ag agric tab. So it's only the result being disclosed. The tab to input the data is the input uh, data tab. We're going to see in the next slide. And here we have the total applied and the total, for example, for nitrogen, the total applied and the total recommended. It's important to mention, and this is uh, what is new on the calculator, we have now total elements organic nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus. So before, in the previous version, we have all together organic and inorganic be entered in the same cell. Now we have this organic in separate cells. So uh, let's move to the next slide that I will uh, explain better how to enter this data. But here, in the final result here, you're going to have the three different, the three ratios for nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus. Uh, the ratio that's going to be the division uh, from the total applied by the total recommended that should be less than 1.05 as we saw before. So here we have the input data tab screenshot. So we have all these rows that are being considered in the calculation for indicators 423 and 424. So as I mentioned before, the amount recommended for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium recommended by soil analysis expressed in kilograms shall be entered in these rows. 142 for nitrogen, 143 for phosphorus, and 144 for potassium. Uh, and here should be the total amount in kilograms for all uh, farms, for all land included in the unit of certification. So if you have a different uh, soil types with different recommendations, you have to sum all the recommendations for the different uh, type of soil. Okay, and for this reason, we have here uh, these two indicators mentioned because this information will be used for the two indicators. And then we have the total element uh, nitrogen fertilizer applied, uh, phosphor and potassium, the same. So you have, again, indicator have to sum up all amount of fertilizer applied. So here means inorganic fertilizer and sum up the different amounts for different types of soil. So in row 139140 and 141. And then here, that is new, we didn't have this uh, splitted before, now it is splitted, 145, 146, and 147. We have to enter the total element organic, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium applied. Sometimes, what is uh, element organic? Sometimes uh, we have other source of nitrogen that's not inorganic or potassium or phosphorus that is uh, with venous or any other type of uh, organic uh, compound 
introduce it to the soil. So if operator know this amount applied, they can include in these cells. But in case the operator doesn't measure this separately or doesn't know this information, it's possible to leave this in blank. It means put zero, zero, and zero here and include this total amount of organic elements applied together with the inorganic here. So it's possible as well. What's not possible to do is put organic and inorganic in these cells above and then repeat only the amount organic here because if you, you do in this way, you're gonna uh, count twice the same amount. So the intention here is sum up all nitrogen applied but it not count more than it in, in fact has been applied. Okay, um, what else I'd like to share with you here? Regarding the recommendation, if the recommendation include, includes uh, fertilizer inorganic and organic, you have to include on the recommendation both. Otherwise, the result can be not the, the actual one, not the, 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 the ratio between the applied and the recommended. Another important uh, thing to mention here is regarding the element of phosphorus. So pay attention that when we are talking about recommended phosphorus, phosphorus uh, it's, it is expressed as P2 O5. So the uh, amount in kilos that you have to include it here is the amount of P2O5. Okay. Then the calculator will convert this P2O5 recommended into P element recommended. So the amount to include it here recommended is in regarding of P2O5. The same for inorganic P2O5 applied. We had to enter the amount applied, express it as P2O5, and then the calculator will, will convert to element P. So this is appearing here on this part of the calculator. But for organic element, for P, you have to enter this amount expressed as P, not as P205. Okay, so pay attention when you, you will enter the data into the calculator what is P and what is P205 because it can make difference. Indicator 4.3.5, the operator maximizes irrigation productivity. So this indicator is here because we would like to clarify how you use the calculator for this indicator. But before going through the calculator, let's review this indicator. So the standard for that, so this applies only for agriculture, uh, and the standard for that is that uh, WPA should be equal or greater than WPO. What is this? What is WP or water productivity. It's a measure of how efficiently irrigation water is used to produce sugarcane. So WP is expressed as uh, a division by cane yield harvested in terms of cane per hectare divided by the net irrigation applied over the growing season. In other words, the volume of water. So it's a ratio, is a division from the productivity in the yield, uh, the yield of productivity in the field, like tons of cane per hectare, divided by the volume of water. So we have a two WP here to be compared. One is the actual one. It means uh, the actual productivity that includes all water applied to the field to grow this cane, comparing to uh, WPO, that is the benchmarking. It means uh, uh, water productivity where no water was applied, only the rainfall, only the rain over the period of this uh, cultivation. So the result should be that the actual one should be, uh, shall be, sorry, uh, equal or greater than the benchmark one. Okay, let's move to the next slide to see how it is considered in the calculator. Here we have the formulas for WPO and WPA. So these formulas has been included in the calculator, but we are putting here just to make it clear 
how it is calculated under Bonsuku calculator. So WPO is expressed by 66 plus 0.05 times the rain. And here the rain is the total rainfall over the season. Uh, we are considering the calculator expressed in millimeters of water. And WPA, uh, the formula is CY. CY is the cane yield expressed in tons per hectare. Then we, div we multiplied by 1,000 because the final um, result is expressed in kilograms, so it's uh, a matter of convert units. And then divided by IRR, that is uh, the net irrigation applied, so a volume of water applied. So all of these uh, inputs will be considered in the Bunsuku calculator. Again, here we have the screenshot of input data for this indicator for 3.5, as well as a P4 Agric tab, which will disclose the result of this calculation. Again, here, my calculator is in blank. There is no data entered. For this reason, there is no result. But it seems you include the data required here in the input data, the calculation will be made here automatically and the result will be disclosed here if comply, compliance or not with the, the standard, okay? So regarding input data, we have four entry points here, four rows that will be considered in this calculation. Uh, the first one is row 70, area harvested irrigated. So here the operator has to include the area in hectares that has been harvested that received irrigation. Uh, here is important again to remember that the calculator considered a 12 months period, so should be the area in this 12 months period harvested that received irrigation. In the following row, 7 to 1, sugar cane harvested, uh, the operator has to put here the total amount in tons of cane that has been harvested in this area reported above. Okay, an auditor has to check the source of this information to confirm if this data, this, this uh, number, uh, are the correct, correct one. Also, is considering this indicator, the row 157, all waters applied on irrigation cane. It means that here the operator has to include the volume in cubic meters of water applied to this area to irrigate this cane. And it means not only water uh, capture extracted from rivers, but all kind of waters. And here in the comments, we have this to remind you. So including extracted water, recycled water, diluted and non-diluted venous and effluents. It means all kind of waters applied in this irrigation. And the last row considered is the total rainfall over the growing season. So in this 12 months period reported in the calculator, operator has to check how many millimeters, that is a, a unit of volume of water, water as well, has been rain during this, uh, this period, this 12 months period. Remember that one millimeter of rain, or one millimeter of any water applied uh, in the fields is the same that 10 cubic meters per hectare, okay? Uh, and then this information will automatically be considered here in the PIC4 Agric tab and uh, the comparisons will be made automatically. Remember that sometimes uh, farms has its own meteorological station to verify the millimeters of rain sometimes uh, the operator doesn't have. Uh, in this case, we recommend you to use official data in case there is no measurement in the, in the farms, in the operator location. So uh, official data can be used provided by local authorities. Other information that's important to make clear here is that sometimes the information 
will not be ready to be entered in the calculator. So sometimes the operator has to do extra calculations before entering the data in, in the calculator. For example, here for row 157, all water is applied. Sometimes the operator has different areas and for each different area, uh, a different irrigation rate has been applied. So it means that we have to calculate separately the amount for each area and then sum up all together. For example, uh, some areas receive only water um, capture from the river and the application rate is, let's suppose, five uh, cubic meters per hectare. So some extra calculations shall be done before. Multiply these five uh, cubic meters per hectare, per hectare times uh, the number of hectares that it has been applied and then that has, uh, has been applied, no, has received this water and this result will be included in the calculator, sum up to others water applied in other areas that compose altogether the unit of certification. So pay attention on this. Sometimes the information is not ready. You have to do some extra calculation before entering the, the data in the Bon Circuit calculator and not only for these uh, 435 four indicators, it can apply for different indicators across the standard. Indicator 4.3.6 is here because there is some confusion about this standard required. So here we have three options and what is important to mention here is that if in the mill there is no effluent discharge, this indicator is not applicable. It's going to be applicable only when there is some effluent discharging, uh, discharging point. Okay, so you have uh, three options. Let's review this indicator to understand it better. We finished this criterion with the indicator 4.3.6 that says that the operator minimizes detrimental effects of waste discharge. So this indicator is applicable to the mill only. And we have three standards that applies. is one or another or another. So the first one that the operator can choose work with is the results for dissolved oxygen. So at least the results should be 2.5 ppm for GO. Alternatively, uh, the operator can choose to work with COD results, and the standard required is less than one kilogram of COD per tons of a product produced. And the third option is work with VOD results, so the standard required is less than two point, sorry, 0 0.25 kilograms of VOD per ton of product. So this uh, indicator uh, works with dissolved oxygen, that is an indicator of the quality of oxygen available in the receiving stream to support life. So it's important to remind that sampling for DO should be carried in the receiving stream. However, if the operator choose work with COD or DO, uh, BOD results, the sampling should be carried in the discharge point. Let's talk about indicators related to agrochemicals. So in the previous version of the standard, we had only two indicators, well, the same, almost the same content of these two indicators, but with different numbers. And now we have four indicators related to agrochemicals. So when we asked about uh, indicators related to agrochemicals, some candidates are still uh, thinking about only these two, but you'd like to clarify that you have more now uh, included. It doesn't mean that these indicators wasn't checked before, but now it is in different indicators to make it easier to check and easier to implement. So indicator 4.4.3, the operator maximized the efficiency of agrochemicals applied, is still the same standard we have before in the standard previous standard that is less than five kilograms of active ingredient per hectare per year. So pay attention here is five kilograms of active ingredient. 
not five kilograms in total. So operator before I enter the data in the calculator has to consider to calculate only the amount of active ingredient applied. Okay. Uh, also, we receive some questions related to which kind of product shall be included here. If some adjuvant, any other uh, chemicals that helps in the application of the agrochemicals shall be included. And the answer is no. Only those that have active ingredients shall be considered in this number. The next indicator, 4.4.4, the operator only applies legal and safe agrochemicals. Uh, it means that there is a list of banned agrochemical that cannot be used. Pay attention that this has been changed. The list of agrochemicals uh, included in the standard has changed, changed a, a little bit. Uh, some remains and some are new. So we're going to talk a little bit further about this soon. And you have two more indicators. 451, the operator safely manages storage facilities and disposes safely of chemicals, fuels, lubricants, and other hazardous materials. So the standard is 100%. All of those uh, products shall uh, be safely managed and storage and disposed. And 452, the operator trains workers on handling and correct use of farms chemical, fail and hazard materials. As I mentioned before, it was covered before in the previous version of the standard, but, but now it's clear in, in a indica, uh, separate indicator. Regarding indicator 4.4.4, the operator only applies legal and safe agrochemicals. Uh, we included this indicator here to show you what are the lists of uh, active ingredients that are not allowed by this indicator to be applied. So we have different lists here comparing to the previous version of the standard. So some of the lists is still the same, but we included uh, three new lists of agrochemicals of active ingredients that are not allowed to be used. So we have a total of seven lists and three are new. And what to do in those cases that there is no other alternative than the banned agrochemical to be used. So sometimes in some countries there is no other uh, active ingredient allowed to be used, only the banned one. So in these cases, uh, the operator has to carry out a research showing that there is no other alternative, no other chemical or non-chemical uh, controls or alternative to be used. In those cases, this will be allowed. It. However, what is new on this standard um, regarding this indicator is that the operator has to carry out a risk management plan to address uh, issues related to use this chemical because this, this banned chemical can uh, promote a danger to the operator that is handling this, this chemical, for example. And through this risk management plan, the operator has to put in place a plan to reduce the use of this chemical or even eliminate. Now we will review principle five, the last one of this standard. Indicator 5.1.1, the operator ensures value is maximized per ton of cane. So we included this indicator here because we would like to do some clarification. Even this indicator is not new on the standard. So this indicator says that the value added by operation is the value of sales less the price of goods, raw materials, including energy, and serves per shade. So the most common question regarding this indicator is what should be considered in this calculation? What should be considered as sales and what should be considered as costs? So here we have the formula explaining how it's calculated. But remember that value add, added is not the same as profit. So the, the, the way of calculation of value added is not the same, we won't be the same as profit is calculated. So here we have an example for growers, for a farm, uh, but the same logic uh, we apply for the sugar mill. So the formula is sum up all sales 
for growers should be all sales of cane and for meal will be all sales of all products that the sugar meal produced and then can sell, discounted by the cost of inputs, all costs to produce this cane or all costs to produce these products. And then it's going to be divided by the total tons of cane produced for the gross, a grower's example or for tons of products produced in case of a sugar meal. So total sales, you have to sum up all sales. And costs, you have to sum up all costs. It includes energy in the case of sugar meal, energy, maintenance costs, uh, products, all inputs, including the cane. The price paid for the cane uh, was that was processed on the sugar meal. The only exception that you have to exclude from these costs is subsidies, salaries, taxes, and benefits repartition, and as well as depreciation. So all these uh, costs shall be excluded from these costs. Okay, and the same applies for uh, growers for farm scope. Indicator 5.2.2, the operator recycles or safely dispose of non-production waste. So we included this indicator here because it still have some uh, misunderstanding regarding the categories that this indicator covers. So this uh, is not new on the standard. We had this indicator uh, in, the, in the previous version and the standard is still the same is recycle or safely dispose at least 50% of the categories uh, included in this indicator. What has been changed comparing the previous version of the standard with the current one, this new one, version 5.1, is are the categories. So before we had six categories, now we have seven categories. So the categories that the operator shall uh, recyclers or safely dispose are fiber, including paper, metal, plastic, plastic, rubber, wood, glass, and electronics. Okay, so it is slightly different comparing the previous version, but it's only seven categories. Okay. Indicator 5.3.1, the operator provides vocational training to workers. So we included this indicator here to clarify the standard required. So what's the minimum hours of vocational training required? So the average shall be 16 hours per year per employee. Okay, so this is the standard required. Also, we received a lot of questions related to this indicator asking if health and safety training shall be considered as vocational trainings. So the answer is no. Vocational trainings are all these trainings focused on developed skills of the workers. Health and safety trainings are focused on make sure that workers have safety conditions to work, that if they are, they are aware of the risks they are exposed, what they have to do to mitigate those risks, among others. Vocational trainings are more focused on the career of the professional, on the career of the workers, on their skills. So it's more focused in develop these skills of the workers. So this indicator aims at ensuring that the operator promotes, attract and retain talents. Indicator 5.4.1, the operator promotes gender inclusion in management and skilled positions. So we included this indicator here because we still have a lot of questions regarding the standard required by this indicator. So this indicator aims at ensuring that the operator promotes gender equality. So what this indicator requires at least is that uh, women presence in management and skilled position across the operation shall be equal or greater than 15%, okay? So, so 15% of management and skilled positions. So a lot of people are asking what a skilled position means, what should be considered as a skilled position. So 
under the guidance of the uh, Monsuk Production Standard Implementation Guidance, there is some examples of skilled position, but you don't need to be restricted to these examples. So operator shall to uh, identify and during the audit, uh, show this to the auditors, what they are considered a skilled position and why they are considered that uh, position as skilled. Okay, so it's open and operator can identify and prove and uh, explain the reasons why they are considered these positions as skilled. So this 15% will apply only for management and skilled position. So it's very important that auditors understand uh, during the audits what the operator has been considered as skilled positions. And remember that there is some examples on the guidance to uh, give uh, a direction or uh, explain better what can be considered as skilled positions. Now we will review some indicators under Bonsucre Mass Balance Chain of Custody Standard, version 5.1. So this version has been published in 2019. It's not a new standard, but we are still receiving some questions related to this uh, document. The indicators that this session of the presentation will, will cover uh, are those on this table. Indicator 1.1.4 training. So we have an indicator that required that the organization uh, operating under chain of custody uh, standard has a training plan in place that involves all personnel related to the chain of custody activities. All of those that are carrying out a task that is related to chain of custody certification shall receive a training. So the first question we receive is if the indicator frames a, f a minimum frequency to carry out this training. So the answer is no, there is no minimum frequency. So the organization has to identify their needs and create an internal procedure to establish a, a who and when the, uh, this personnel has to be trained. So, for example, you can include uh, when new people joined or new people are carrying, uh, carrying out tasks related to the chain of custody standard uh, certification, or if there is an actualization, a new version of the standard, or even est establish a frequency of refresh training. So there is no minimum required. It's totally up to the operator, to the organization, decide this and put it in its internal uh, procedure. Also, another uh, question that we received is if this training shall be uh, delivered by Bansuku as organization. And there is no requirement related to this. So this training can, uh, can be carried out internally by internal staff of the organization. It can be hired a consultant to provide this training. Also, Bunsuku counts with a training provider that is licensed by Bunsuku that can provide this kind of training as well. So there is no rule. The important here is that the organization establish this training plan and establish its rules and uh, act in accordance with this plan. Uh, indicator 2.1.6 talks about inventory periods. We are including this here just to make it clear that inventories under Bansukru chain of custody standard shall uh, be carried out at fixed regular intervals. And those intervals shall not exceed exceeding three months. So it means that it can be less than three months, can be two months, can be one month, but it never more than three months. Also, these uh, regular intervals shall be continuous in time. So no gaps between one period and another are allowed. So they have to, to be continuous. And also this uh, period of inventory shall be documented by the organization. When we talk about uh, multi-site scope, it's important to mention that each site has to carry out its own uh, inventory, but it, we have to have one inventory for all the multi-sites, for all the sites together. 
the indicator 2.1.7 is about the balancing of Bansuku certified volumes during and between inventory periods. So this indicator requires that the volume of Bansuku certified product received in one specific site shall be greater than or equal to the volume that was supplied to clients uh, over this inventory period that we saw that shall be maximum three months. So at the end of the inventory period, the balance uh, of receiving certified volume and supplying certified volume shall be zero or positive. When we have uh, positive volumes, a positive balancing in the end of the inventory period, this volume can be carried over to the next period. Another important uh, information to be clarified, we received a lot of questions regarding this, is if it's possible to be negative during an inventory period. Let's suppose that, that we have a three months inventory period and before finishing these three months, is it possible to be negative on the balance? And the answer is yes, it is pos it's possible. However, uh, the operator, the organization, shall cover this negative volume by the end of the inventory period. So it's not possible to uh, end the inventory period with negative uh, balancing. It must be zero in the end or positive. And when we talk about multi-site certification, it's important to say that this balance shall be made for all sites together. Meaning that if you have a shortage of uh, volume in one site, it can be offset by a surplus of another site. So here we have an example of a multi-site scope uh, that we have a head office and two sites, two factories, one in Mexico, site A, and site B in Canada. So here we have the in and out for site, uh, site A. So in this case, we have a 200 uh, tons of volume received and no volume uh, supplied for clients. And here, regarding the site B, we have no incoming, no, uh, the site didn't receive any certified volume, but it have 100 tons of volume out, means uh, sold to clients. So what we are talking about when considering a mood site scope is that we can consider uh, this inventory for all sites together. It means the inventory periods must be consolidated into one balance. So here we have this one balance for the two sites. We have all purchase for all sites and all sales. In this case, in this example, in this stream, let's considering that this mood site works uh, with inventory checks every three months. So here we are considering three months period. So these two sites received 200 tons and sold 100 tons. It means that the group has a balance, this mood site has a balance of 100 tons of a product. Okay. It's important to say that mood site scopes apply for sites under chain of custody scope, for example, refineries, storage facilities, and any other factory that use any derivatives from sugarcane in, uh, in its uh, formulation. Mood site scope is not allowed for sugar mills, so sugar mill has to be certified uh, individually, not in a mood site scope. Now we will review some items under Bonsuk Certification Protocol version 6. The sections and requirements to be covered in this part of the presentation are listed in this table. Closing meeting. So session 17 on certification protocol uh, brings everything that shall be covered by the auditor during the closing meeting. So we are including these uh, session here to show you where you can find this information under Bonsuku certification protocol. So the issue is not what shall be covered 
but it more related to where to find this information. So Bansuku Certification Protocol brings a lot of information regarding our certification system and session 17 brings everything that shall be covered uh, during a closing meeting. Here we have very important information to share with you that is regarding conform to level grading. So you can find more details on session 18 of certification protocol version 6, but it's basically uh, about conform to level grading. So which kind of conformity one indicator can receive, all right? So let's start with production standard. And here, when we talk about production standard, it includes the smallholder standard as well, okay? So as you know, Monsuku production standard has core and non-core indicators. When we are talking about core indicators, we have different types of conformant uh, applicable. This one, one core indicator can receive a conformity against him, against it, against it a incidental non-conformity, a systemic non-conformity, or a observation. So this is new. Before, we had different approach. So we don't talk anymore about major and minor non-conformity. So you, have, you can have a conformity against an indicator, a incidental non-conformity, a systemic non-conformity, or one observation when we are talking about core indicators. If we are talking about non-core indicators, we have only three classification. This indicator can receive a conformity against, a non-conformity, or one observation. And when we talk about a chain of custody standard, we have, again, only conformity, non-conformity, and observation. It means that incidental and systemic non-conformity applies only to core indicators on Monsuku production standard that includes the smallholders uh, standard as well. And what are the differences between one incidental nonconformity and a systemic nonconformity? So here we have the definition that is published in the certification protocol, but it basically uh, both of them can be issued against a core indicator. So core indicators on the production standard are those that the operator has to comply with 100% of them. Uh, it was it has been created because there is different realities among all operators, and sometimes we can find a nonconformity against a core indicator. That is something isolated, one uh, isolated event, something uh, limited in time. Is not something systemic. It's something that. Uh, we, it's possible to evidence that the operator has a management system that promotes the engagement with this indicator. So the operator has implemented a lot of, a lot of actions to promote this uh, indicator, to engage with this indicator, to comply with this indicator. However, when evidence showed that it's not 100% in compliance, so there is something isolated that is not in compliance, but the system the operator has in place uh, prevent this practice to happen. So this is one incidental nonconformity. When we talk about systemic nonconformity is when uh, there is no compliance with this indicator, but there is no management system in place. So meaning that the operator doesn't uh, are not engaged with this indicator. There is no actions implemented to comply with this indicator. It's not something uh, isolated is something systemic and for this reason we classify this as systemic nonconformity. And what is one observation? So observation can be issued only for those indicators that are in conformity. Observation doesn't mean nonconformity. So conformity shall be established. However, it has been identified that some opportunities of improvement are needed. And then, if not addressed, it may lead to a nonconformity in the next audit. The next item that we would like to, to make some clarifications is regarding certification decision. So 
we realize that we still have a lot of misunderstanding uh, regarding the certification decision process. Who is the responsible to make this decision? What sh shall be taken into consideration? And for this reason, we included this here. So everything related to certification decision is covered in the section 20 of the protocol. And basically, the person responsible to make the certification decision is the CB technical manager. The CB technical manager shall base his decision, her decision, on the recommendation of the lead auditor. So the technical manager shall review all evidence reported by the audit team to the audit reports, check the recommendation of the lead auditor if the lead auditor are recommending this uh, organization to be certified or not. And now, so the technical manager, the CB technical manager, uh, shall make this final decision uh, providing that nothing has come to his or her attention that cause him believe that there are errors in the evidence collected by the audit team. So they have to be sure that evidence collected are uh, the corrected ones. And based on that, the CB technical manager can uh, make the certification decision. Also, the CB technical manager has to uh, uh, verify the pass rate applicable for the scope uh, they are analyzing. So we have two tables on certification protocol. One is the table 10 and the other is the table 11 that uh, explains this pass rate uh, to, get to get certified. So in, uh, under table 10, we have this uh, pass rate for audited against production and chain of custody standards. So uh, is the case of farms and mills, where the both standards apply. So to get uh, certified, to have a positive uh, cert uh, certification decision, this operator has to comply with 100% of core indicators, at least 60% of non-core indicators, and with 100% of chain of custody indicators. Regarding a scope that include only chain of custody standard, the pass rate is pass rate is 100% of the indicators applicable for this scope. So the operator has to comply with 100% of indicators. And we arrived in the end of this presentation. Thank you very much for watching this. And if you have further questions, please do not hesitate to contact us. You can send your questions to standardsadministrator.com and we will reply this to you. Thank you so much for watching.